depending on where you're joining from today. Thank you for joining our Tuesday live stream. Uh, we've had a couple week hiatus here um, due to summer holiday and whatnot, but we're back here resuming our weekly uh, Tuesday live stream. Um, thanks for being here. Today's topic we're going to cover is uh, digitization in 2025 and beyond key trends in enterprise technology. So we're going to talk about digital strategy type stuff. If I were to summarize the the topic, we're going to we're going to talk about it's digital strategy type stuff as well as just trends and things that are emerging in the marketplace that are important to be aware of. Uh, my name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we're an independent consulting firm that helps clients reach the third stage of digital transformation success. Um, this live stream that you're part of here today is actually going to be part of our Transformation Ground Control podcast. So we film. Um, the core interviews for each episode of that podcast, we film those live in a live stream format. It gets edited. We put other content around it. We polish it up and put it in uh, the podcast format. So uh, you're getting to see how the sausage is made by being part of this live stream here uh, today. Um, and that episode, by the way, that will feature this interview will be released a week from tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. Every Wednesday, we release new episodes of Transformation Ground Control on YouTube, LinkedIn, and all the audio podcast platforms. And speaking of those audio podcast platforms and you, YouTube and LinkedIn, we are streaming to YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we're even on Stitch right now as well. Um, so we're, we're streaming to several uh, channels and several platforms uh, right now. So thanks for joining. Wherever you're joining from, we're going we're gonna to get to chat and questions. And, and we want to hear your feedback as well. Any kind of questions or topics you want to cover. Uh, that's the reason we do this live is so we can get your engagement and feedback as well. So encourage any any thoughts or any uh, questions you have to please please chime in. Uh, before I introduce our guest, as we talk about digitization in 2025 and beyond, key trends in enterprise technology, if you could, the audience uh, joining us here today, if you could just drop in the chat where you're joining us from, uh, what country and what city you're in. I uh, always love to hear where the global audience is joining from and just to understand the diversity and the uh, the uh, diverse group we've got here uh, on the line, we usually get a pretty global audience. So it's always interesting and fun to see where everyone's joining from uh, today as part of this global digital transformation community. Um, so as I mentioned, our topic today is key trends in enterprise technology. As you think through the 2020s and beyond, as you think about your digital strategy and roadmap, what are those things we should all be aware of? What are those trends and emerging uh, patterns that are developing in the marketplace? And with us to help unpack that conversation and get his viewpoints today is Greg Benton, the Chief Strategy Officer here at Third Stage Consulting. Greg, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Eric. Great to be with everyone today. Um, you know, it's it's really a pleasure to join and uh, and bring some experience to the conversation and also uh, maybe contribute a little bit to the to the entire day. So, absolutely. And you were part of our, our podcast and our live stream a few weeks ago where we did a, a, a consulting panel discussion. So this isn't your first time uh, on the show, although it is your first time in a one-on-one -on -one interview format. So thanks for thanks for joining today. Oh, uh, absolutely. And I, I promise not to bring any props today like the uh, balloon. <laughs> so. Yeah, we were talking about, well, we were talking about inflated expectations was a, was a point you were trying to make yes. around digital transformation and you had a, you just happened to have a balloon handy to uh, help just, visual. Concept. Just happened to. Thought it would enhance the visual experience. <laughs> right. Yeah. We'll see what kind of visual aid you can work into the conversation here uh, today as well. <laughs> um, so you're chief strategy officer at third stage. Uh, you're relatively right. new to the company, but um, I've known you for about 10 years now. And more importantly, you've been in this industry for more than 20 years. So uh, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and what it is you do uh, now that you're at third stage. What do you do at third stage? Sure, Eric. You know, I, uh, I really come from 20 plus years of implementing, remediating and um, deploying ERP systems and software. Uh, also managing the, uh, the vendor relationships with the software vendors and the systems integrators. But I've had the pleasure of working in partnership with over 100 clients. In, within those years, bringing experience to bear to uh, really advise them on the path toward digital transformation. And that's what I'm doing here at Third Stage, actually getting very involved with the, uh, the dedicated people here in a really mission driven type of uh, approach to uh, digital transformation success with our clients and uh, happy to join the discussion today. Right. Well, great. It's great to have you here today and also great to have you at third stage after joining uh, earlier this year. 
And one of the things that's interesting about your background is, especially as we get into the conversation here today, is that prior to joining Third Stage, obviously Third Stage is technology agnostic, we're independent, we work with all kinds of vendors and we help clients select and implement all sorts of technologies. Um, but prior to joining Third Stage, you've worked in a number of different uh, channels or different ecosystems related to sp specific systems. Can you just tell us a little bit about some of the some of the technologies or different systems you've worked with over the years prior to joining Third Stage? Sure. I mean, that's a uh, that's a great point. I love to talk about that. Uh, worked in a number of industries, including healthcare, manufacturing, uh, distribution, um, certainly. Uh, 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 the uh, the retail industry as well, and I've worked with uh, Infor, Epicor, Oracle, Workday, SAP, uh, many of the major software vendors, and also a few of the uh, what we call edge solutions or specifically focused solutions like Kronos and Workforce Management that is now UKG. But in all of that time, uh, I've always maintained a very close connection with the ERP vendors in terms of access and in terms of their roadmap, but uh, also maintain that, that independence and an advisory relationship rather than a systems integrator relationship. And that's very important and key in putting together the strategy and selection process for a client that is looking for a solution that's going to fit them, that's going to fit their business processes, that's going to be appropriate for them individually. So it's very client centric. That's why with the, uh, with the third stage um, kind of place in the, uh, in the market and the ecosystem, it fits very well with that experience. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's pretty rare to have that diverse background, that diverse experience in a number of different systems focused uh, roles and, and that sort of thing, which is a big part of why you're such a good fit. Uh, at, at third stage and that that'll give you an interesting perspective in our in our conversation today as well good so. well so i guess if you if you sort of back up and you just you, you look at the last 20 years 20 plus years that you've been doing this uh in this space with enterprise technology um what are how, how have the how have the enterprise technology needs of organizations evolved over the years i mean because in some ways i don't know about you but in some ways you look back at your history or your career you look back 10, 20 years, a lot of stuff hasn't changed, you know, in the ways organizations operate and the way they approach digital transformations, which in many ways is a problem in the space. Um, but there, in other ways that the landscape has shifted dramatically in terms of the technology and, and all that sort of stuff. But just in general, how, how would you say the enterprise tech needs of organizations have evolved in more recent years? Well, I, I think the needs are, are still relatively the same. So, uh, organizations are still looking for ways to run HR, payroll, finance, supply chain. And, uh, you know, that's that's unfortunately or fortunately been considered really back office applications over the last decade. And in many cases, it's just been what's needed to run operations. Right. There has been no strategic advantage associated with the applications that that run the business the enterprise resource planning um but you know fast forward to today after you know a decade of, of neglect the software vendors have been improving their systems and improving the way that they they uh, integrate and interoperate and that provides strategic advantage in terms of lowering bottom line costs increasing top line advantage and competitive position in the marketplace. Uh, so ERP systems have really evolved into operational systems. So the enterprise operations now encompasses workforce management and uh, document management and uh, uh, banking and finance systems and automation in that direction. And all of those interrelated pieces of the operations picture can now be managed by either a single source uh, ERP vendor or multiple ERP solutions within a single corporate environment. And that's, that's where we come down to a, a new selection of platform as well as functional and technical systems within the, uh, within the enterprise. 
And that right. really is a marked, marked change over the last decade. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, you had, you had a couple points that I want to come to or, or maybe dig into a little bit on, on that, which, which are really interesting. One being um, early in that response, you mentioned something about competitive advantage um, and, and the word ERP in the same sentence. So I'm just wondering, do you, do you see companies viewing ERP systems and enterprise technologies in general differently in terms of viewing it as more of a competitive advantage versus a necessary evil or just something they have to do? Um, because I think that's a, a mindset that that is important to digital transformations in general, just really understanding what it is you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to further the organization and become more competitive? Or are you just trying to keep up? Or are you just trying to you know, have the necessary evil of implementing back office technologies. I mean, how, how do you view that evolving, if if at all, in, in the industry? Absolutely. In the past, if it was uh, not broke, don't fix it, was kind of the attitude for ERP systems. But now, uh, really, people are looking at bottom line cost uh, for supporting the applications. The cloud environment, the multi-tenant cloud especially, has uh, reduced the cost of operations. Mm. Uh, that brings a bottom line cost reduction that many organizations are desperately in need of. Um, speed and automation of processes. So taking away the kind of the manual uh, process of taking information from one system, porting it over to another system, crunching the numbers, and then making decisions based upon days old or weeks old information uh, really slow down an organization, right? Mm. So now the ability to gather information in real time from multiple and disparate different sources within the organization in one source of the truth is, is providing a real competitive advantage in terms of speed, speed to market, uh, logistics and delivery in, the term, in terms of uh, manufacturing and distribution. Um, the, uh, uh, the management of supply chains and being able to work with selected suppliers in, in order to uh, bolster the, uh, the supply chain to either a manufactured product or a service delivery is has been magnified tenfold by the new technologies. So that's where people are getting strategic advantage out of their, their ERP or operation systems. Right. Yeah, and it, it seems like if, if organizations can figure out how to manage their transformations better than they have historically, then they'll be able to not only automate their back office functions and become more efficient, but also move to that next level of, uh, of value in terms of revenue generating activities, competitive differentiators, all that sort of stuff. But it seems like a lot of organizations or so many organizations get stuck just trying to automate something simple like just the GL and accounting. And if they get, can't get past that, then they're not going to be able to get to the point of a lot of the stuff you're talking about, which is truly automating the business, differentiating themselves, providing better customer experience, customer service, all that, all that good stuff. Absolutely. And that's the reason why developing a strategy and developing the objectives of what you want as an organization to look like in the future state is, is really important. It's imperative to, to actually achieving that in the digital transformation. What are you transforming to? And there's also a difference between optimizing the systems that you have along the way so that uh, you do a, uh, a lowercase t transformation as you're getting to the digital transformation that provides competitive advantage, that provides strategic advantage in the marketplace as you, uh, as you finalize what that end model looks like. Yeah. Right, right. Well, good. Well, I, I have a few more questions I want to get to uh, here, but before I, I keep going with with additional questions to build on what you, you were just talking about, I want to come back to the audience and uh, recognize uh, where people are joining from today. And yeah. speaking of automation and broken systems, I have my own situation here today where uh, for some reason the, the stream isn't, our, our software isn't capturing the chat um, the way it should for all the platforms. So I manually have it open on different devices. So I'm sort of demonstrating the pain of what can what can happen when technology doesn't work well. Um, I'm sort of experiencing that with everyone here real time, which is a, a great case study of, of digital transformation, I suppose. Um, but so forgive me if I if it looks like I'm looking at different devices because I am. Um, so I want to it looks like we have uh, 
from YouTube. We have someone, uh, Clayton, joining from Queensland, Australia. Thank you for being here all the way from Australia. Um, over on LinkedIn, which is the manual part I have to do here and look at my phone. Um, thank you, Yaser from uh, Saudi Arabia from being here. Kyler from Denver. Uh, Malk from Manchester, UK. Sam Graham from Spain. Thank you for being here again, uh, Sam. And uh, those are just a few examples of where where some people are joining from today. So uh, thanks everyone for being here uh, globally and as part of this global digital transformation community. Uh, Francesco from uh, Italy over on YouTube. Thank you for being here. Um, and um, so I guess, in, in by the way, for the audience, before I keep going with my questions here, any questions you have as it relates to enterprise tech trends, digital transformation now and in the future, please feel free to drop that in the chat. And despite my technical issues, I am checking uh, all the streams here, as painful as it may uh, seem and look, um, I will absolutely do that. So um, when you look at um, the speed of technology, so, so I mentioned before, you know, just my personal opinion is that the speed of technology is accelerating rapidly, but it, in some ways it seems like organizations are sort of stuck, you know, they're sort of stuck trying to deploy technologies the same way they did, you know, 20 plus years ago when you and I started our careers. Um, but in other ways, you know, the technology is changing really rapidly. So how's that speed of change of technology? How is that affecting organizations and how organizations, how do you see organizations dealing with that rapid pace of change, given the fact that people in organizations tend to change slower than technology itself? Well, that's a, that's a little bit of a leading question because I think that organizations that are looking at uh, making a change, especially enterprise-wide, are, are really just looking internally and trying to decide how can they move forward, how can they establish uh, governance and management of selecting a system and moving forward with the implementation and deployment of that system. And very often they, they don't think about um, bringing in a third party that has really done this literally hundreds of times to help with that, that process and that strategy. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's remarkable the number of people that we talk with that make a decision for technology reasons, and then they do what we commonly refer to as a lift and shift of the old processes into the new technology. And that creates kind of an equation that um, yeah, I've, I've used in the past, but it's um, new technology, old processes equals expensive old processes. So if you don't really look at the business process that is underlying what you're trying to do as a uh, strategic decision with regard to technology, then the alignment doesn't happen. The adoption doesn't happen. The change management is difficult. Um, there's a lot that goes into the preparation for an organization to undertake this digital journey that, uh, that people kind of pass up and just go immediately into the implementation. And that's where I think that uh, people get uh, slowed down, really bogged down. Yeah, it, it kind of brings to mind that, that term that I think it was, uh, I think it was Michael Hammer, one of the BPR, you know, process reengineering gurus or thought leaders back in the 90s, I think it was, um, he would talk about the concept of paving the cow paths and how, you know, if you pave the cow paths, it's not an efficient uh, way to to run your operations. And by the way, I was in uh, just recently, I was in, I think it was Atlanta. I was in Atlanta or somewhere in the Southeast United States. And I remember someone saying that the reason the roads were so winding and aimless and easy to get lost in, although I can get lost in any city, uh, even including my own. So that's myself is not a good example of this. But um, in general, the reason why these roads are so disorganized is because they actually did pave the cow paths, which I didn't know was actually a thing. But um, Michael Hammer, one of these business process reengineering gurus, talked about um, process management in some ways is paving the cow paths. And I think that's what you're referring to is organizations that just take their existing processes that are already broken, inefficient, aren't well thought out, aren't strategically improved. You slap new technology on that and it gets is just a more expensive way of doing the same things without the value to come along with that. Um, so that's, that's a really good point. Yeah. And, and I, I think a lot of organizations don't properly prepare. They don't think about a, uh, a phase zero where they're actually preparing the organization for that digital change, for data migration, for integration with the new systems and the legacy systems. 
So, um, you know, that that is a piece that's very often missed and people jump right into software selection and implementation right up front. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a really important point you're touching on there. And I think that's a, you know, you talk about tech changing on one hand, technology is changing, there's cloud, there's all this other stuff we're going to get to throughout this conversation. Um, so it's changing quickly. The value potential of technology is only increasing and improving and accelerating. But organizations tend to do what you just described, which is they go find new technology and they just rush right in and start deploying it. And thinking that if we rush right in and start deploying it, we're going to get value faster, right? It, it sort of right. makes sense. But the reality is you, you end up rushing and barreling down this path of the status quo and just putting in new technology faster to automate or to you know put technology in to support the status quo. And that dynamic is, is sort of what you're saying. We, we typically with our clients will counter with that implementation readiness or that phase zero of an implementation and taking your time to get that piece right. Well, think about the organization too, because you're going to spend the next year to two years implementing the, the new technology, right? With the, uh, the new ERP system. What do you do in the meantime? What happens to the people in their day jobs that are running the organization and the legacy system as they're you know, needed to understand the processes that are going to be conveyed to the new system and then being able to run that in the new system? Um, you know, that transition, that journey is is very seldom really well mapped out. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of kind of strategy, selection of a true partner on the uh, on the software side, and then get into a phase zero where you're preparing the organization for that change, for that change management, and then ultimately for the user adoption and use of the system in the future. Right, right. Yeah, and... Uh... Uh, Kyler, who's our, who's my podcast uh, co-host, is in on this conversation too, and she made the comment over here on LinkedIn that uh, this is everything we're talking about here right now is sort of like digital transformation insurance. Um, you're, you're sort of insuring, which I, which I like. It's sort of like an insurance policy to make sure that you are not only successful and and keep the project on track and you, and you don't screw it up, for lack of a better word, but that you take it a step further and not only don't screw it up, but you're actually getting value out of it and all, everything you're talking about here is sort of a, an insurance policy to ensure that that stuff happens. Absolutely. And, you know, think about the return on investment too. You're not, no one's going into a, to an ERP replacement or, you know, an operational upgrade system optimization without having an expectation that there is going to be a return on the investment at the end of this, that it's going to be measurable, right? And so you really do have to put that insurance kind of uh, guardrails around the entire project and the deployment to make sure that when you get to the end, uh, your users are, are fully enrolled, is, it, is a term that I use, that they're adopting it, that they are even agents of change in terms of the, uh, the go forward strategy for the organization. We want to get from here to there, and it's going to make my work, my life easier, simpler, better, and the organization is going to thrive with the new system. Well, you can't get there without a complete roadmap and following through with everything that you develop as an organization to get there. Right. Right. And here's a, I want to get to an audience comment here, which I think um, illustrates or maybe helps us come at this from a, from a different perspective, or maybe, uh, maybe it's a, an obstacle you can help us unpack here, Greg. But this is from Clayton over on YouTube. He, he has a comment here, which is, here's our challenge. Not having an ARP is costing us the time we need to implement an ARP. Kind of like a pair of scissors that come in a package that can only be opened with a pair of scissors. So I, I guess, you know, maybe if I could take that a step further and, and flip that into a question for you, Greg. Um, it, it, I think it feeds into what you were just saying, that organizations tend to rush into an implementation. And in this case, I would yeah. think this is a situation where the organization is probably chomping at the bit wanting to get a new system, new technology in there as quickly as possible because they need to so badly because they're so inefficient and they don't, you know, they struggle to find the time to implement effectively. How do you, you know, how do you counterbalance that? Or how do you, how do you find that right balance between, you know, the, the urgency of putting in new technology versus getting it right and, you know, making sure you take the time to do everything you're talking about here? Well, I, I think that's a, a great example, right, of the, uh, 
the, the need to determine where you want to go and how you're going to operate as a business or as an organization in the meantime, in the interim. So you've got to, you've got to do your day job, um, you know, while you're implementing a new software system and the new software system and the, uh, and the platform that it comes on and the integration of all of the systems that you've been using that, um, you know, provide specific value to the organization need to be integrated in a, in a single plan, in a, in a go forward strategy. And so that is getting back to that, that entire strategy selection phase zero preparation for the organization to move forward. So that you're not, uh, you know, in this case, you're not even paving cow paths. You're, uh, <laughs> you're constructing pow, cow paths and then paving them, right? right. <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's what, it, you know, it really takes that upfront um, uh, decision-making establishing governance that is going to have the uh, kind of the shepherding responsibility for the organization through that interim phase between having no ERP system and then having a complete unified system at the end. Right. Right. Makes total sense. Um, so just in general, and I want, I want to, uh, after this question, I want to dive into some more specifics that um, we'll get into, but sort of keeping it you know, at this high level still, what are some of the most important trends you're seeing in the enterprise tech and digital transformation space? I know you've touched on a few of them already as we've talked about these other topics, but what are some of those important trends you're seeing? I guess more from a, maybe more from a technological perspective. Sure. Well, um, you know, I will say that, uh, that I came from a, uh, an ASP background. So application service providers used to do what is now called cloud which is hosting technology, right? Um, the, the cloud's uh, a better name, the, right? It's, it's, so ASP is the same thing. ASP is, is pretty much the same thing as cloud, but cloud's just a better name, and that name has really caught on better than- Cloud's a much better name. <laughs> and it also describes, it describes a different process, right? Right. So um, cloud computing, especially multi-tenant cloud, is, is an instance of the software in the cloud that's continually upgraded. And that's that's a huge technology change. The uh, the other piece of that is, uh, you know, there are there are multiple cloud systems out there. There are multiple on-premise systems that have to stay depending upon, you know, the manufacturing process or depending upon, you know, in, in the case of healthcare providers, connection with the uh, the EHR system or clinical systems, and so they need to stay connected and interoperable. And that's what I'm seeing as a trend is that you really have to pull multiple systems together and have them integrate and interoperate. In other words, bi-directional information flow to have a unified system going forward. And one of the one of the changes that's happening very rapidly is people are looking for rapid time to value in terms of integrating those systems into a unified platform. That's ultimately the goal of a of a of a new ERP system, right? is you have one single source of the truth for all the data coming in. If you can connect those and connect the disparate systems up front, instead of uh, doing it along at, at the end of the implementation, then you can derive real value starting within, you know, a couple of months of starting the, uh, the digital transformation journey. Hmm. So that's, that's what I'm seeing as an important technology change is that interoperability hub or central spoke of this entire process. Yeah. And you mentioned before in one of the earlier questions, I, I asked you, you, you touched on this whole concept of a platform um, and how companies or organizations are not only thinking about single ERP systems as they may have in the past, but now thinking more about just what's the general platform and what, what systems can I sort of plug and play and mix and match into that platform environment? Could you maybe talk about that and, or, and elaborate on this interoperability concept while we're, while we're at it? Absolutely. Uh, you know, a, a, a great friend of mine and, and really an industry expert, and, um, you know, Eric, you are one, but this, this was another one. <laughs> you mean there's more than this, one? Oh. Describe oh. all of those interrelated systems and the, uh, you know, the, the applications and everything that runs an organization as variously a, a haystack or a spaghetti bowl. 
And um, a lot of those things are not going to change as you go forward. You know, you're, you're still going to have elements of the haystack feeding into a core ERP system at the center and needing a way to connect that. The, uh, the interoperability idea is pulling together all of those sources of information into one central repository, normalizing that data, and then reporting out that data on a, on a kind of a, a top end basis that, um, that really celebrates finding the needle in the haystack. So that's, that's yeah. really what's, what's happening in the future is all of those systems coming together to operate the organization or to you know, propel the organization forward need to interoperate, especially for that interim period that we talked about. So as you're starting the implementation, how am I going to operate from now until a year from now, two years from now, when my ERP system is fully implemented? That has to interoperate while you're getting there. And you think about mergers, acquisitions, PE firms, and you know the, uh, the bringing in of affiliates and other organizations into the operations system, you need a way to connect them as you're going. So be able to uh, interoperate as your organization is actually changing along the way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it almost seems like um, one could view ERP as sort of a central core, you know, for financials, inventory management, master data type stuff. But and that's going to, you know, be a be a common core that a lot of organizations could leverage. But when it comes to your specific industry or your specific needs or some of the more advanced capabilities outside of that core, things like demand planning or um, business intelligence, uh, even when you get into artificial intelligence and things like that, it seems like that's where you, you sort of want to build that sort of a hub and spoke sort of model where you, you do have a core. You could still have a core ERP system, but you also need to look at how can we extend that core and add on different technologies that can that could expand that capability. Absolutely. And, and we've been talking about, uh, you know, some of the uh, the major ERP systems and some of the ancillary or edge solutions. But if you think about enterprise performance management, bringing something into a, a strata or, you know, one of the one of the EPM solutions. Uh, the, all of that information needs to flow into a central repository, to your point, that is a core ERP system, but then it, to become actionable, it needs to be real-time data that predicts what's happening for the enterprise, for the organization going forward. And that provides that strategic advantage that we were talking about in the very beginning, that new ERP systems that connecting new ERP systems as a holistic enterprise operations platform is, is really what drives value. So, you know, um, the people that are listening, people globally, you can actually become an agent of change within your organization, pointing out how all of this can come together uh, mm -hmm. pretty simply, but you need to be aware of what's out there, what's available, how systems interoperate. And, um, you know, you need to choose a good partner to do that again finding the needle in the haystack. Right. And to find that needle in the haystack too, you know, you need a certain level yeah. of objectivity and neutrality, independence, all the stuff that third stage espouses and, and provides to our, to our clients. Otherwise you're going to, you know, cause I think if you talk to an ERP vendor and ask them about what you just said, they might say, yeah, yeah, but our software is the needle in the haystack. Just right. deploy our software. That'll give you all these edge solutions, all these hub and spoke types of capabilities. But I think, you know, anyone that's been doing this for long enough knows that ERP systems or no, no sort of enterprise technology can be everything to everyone. It's just not possible. Um, so you, you have to find the, the technology, the right mix and match that, that works best for you as an organization. Absolutely. Well said. And speaking of well said here from, from Ryan on LinkedIn, here's a really good question that, that I wanted to, um, that's relevant to what we're talking about here. And it maybe helps us build on it a little bit. But you know, again, I apologize. I can't show it on the screen because I'm having my my own digital transformation issues with uh, this our streaming <laughs> software. But uh, the comment here is: I absolutely struggle with the whole making your ERP the place where you store and do everything. I personally think you should have your ERP be viewed as plug and play. 
let other systems who are strong and amazing at what they do just augment and make your ERP that much better. Um, I think that's a really good, I think that's well said. What, what are your thoughts on that sort of that plug and play, you know, have ERP be a central hub, but you're still sort of mixing and matching or plugging and playing other, other technologies to get more value out of that ERP system. Well, Ryan, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you that it, it would be nice if you could plug and play the ERP system, especially if you have uh, things like, uh, you know, an independent data warehouse where you're bringing all that information into one repository and reporting out of it. Uh, very cool. But I can tell you that the major ERP systems um, have really evolved over the last even, even two years and accelerated by the pandemic to include a lot of those kind of unified platform elements that can bring data real time from multiple sources within the organization and report out on it. So I, I think that you used to have to have a completely separate data warehouse or EPM enterprise performance management strategy on top of core ERP. But I think a lot of the ERP systems now have incorporated, have acquired, have grown that uh, that capability as well. So that's where it comes down to, you know, what is the best fit for my organization? Should I have a separate uh, data management and analytics strategy, or should I have that incorporated as part of my ERP strategy? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great point. And you you've hit on and mentioned a few different tech, types of technologies <laughs> that can they can help, you know, your data analytics and business intelligence, uh, you know, CRM on the sales side, supply chain yeah. management on the supply chain side, you have HCM on the HR side. Um, so I think that's, data you know, there's a lot of bank, banking. Yeah. Yeah. EHR and one, someone on uh, LinkedIn, one, in one of the chats I was just looking at, someone else mentioned healthcare and that's an industry, oh, yeah. you know, well, that they have the electronic health records uh, types of technologies to augment uh, ERP systems as well. Um, so what, one of the concepts that you and I have talked about, uh, over the years is this concept of the difference between, uh, difference between ERP or enterprise wide technologies and enterprise operations. Could you maybe help us understand that difference and why it's important to digital transformation? Yeah. Uh, ERP was really kind of a siloed, um, uh, set of applications that would run HR, payroll, finance, supply chain, as we talked about before, really managed and developed within those departments, within those roles and stakeholders within the organization. Um, operations or enterprise operations includes all of those applications, certainly following a, an enterprise-wide executive sponsored vision for where the organization needs to go and how all of those pieces will interrelate, interoperate and integrate so that uh, to Ryan's point, you can bring all of the information to a central source and use that as one, one source of the truth. Um, that often spans disparate and legacy systems that have to remain in your digital strategy and transformation. So, you know, that's, that's where we really need to make some, some decisions about what that core enterprise solution looks like. And operations in, includes all of the ecosystem of applications and systems that run the entire enterprise. So it's no longer just ERP. It's no longer yeah. your grandfather's ERP, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's a, it's a good way to rethink, you know, what, when you think about digital transformation, which is part of why um, I think digital transformation is a, is a better word for organizations than just ERP or just, you know, plug in technology name here. It's because the mix of technologies to, to support that, those enterprise operations that you're talking about is going to vary, you know, depending on what your needs are and what industry you're in and all that good stuff, what sort of value you're trying to create for the organization. But again, you know, you get organizations that can't even get past the basic automation of GL and accounting, let's just say. If you if you struggle with that and you fail in an implementation of a GL and accounting system and maybe a basic inventory management system, then you're never going to get to that stuff that you're talking about because you, you've, you know, you've uh, 
blown all your resources just trying to get something more simple in place. I, it seems like that's where a lot of organizations struggle, at least in, in my opinion. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, and, and think about, to expand on your point, global organizations, where you've got a rollout to, you know, 60, 70 locations all over the, all over the globe uh, that, are, that are run by different stakeholders, different cultures, you know, bringing all of that together in a, in a central digital strategy or transformation strategy is, is a, a huge undertaking, but it, it can be accomplished if you take the kind of localization out of it and, and develop a central strategy for that core ERP system and one central source of the truth, and then um, kind of dispersing that or delivering that to the, uh, to the remote locations in a hub and spoke manner. So hub and spoke deployments have, have become really kind of the norm, especially for global operations. So that's, um, you know, I don't know if that's directly answering your question, but, uh, but that's where I, th I see things going for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, and it does answer my question. Thanks for, thanks for adding <laughs> to that. And here's, a, here's another question from uh, Mitch on LinkedIn. He asks, often we hear start with the end of, let me try that again. Often we hear start with the end in mind on determining what the goal or desired state to be achieved is regarding digital transformation. Is there ever really an end in terms of digital transformation or does it turn into an arms race with your industry and your industry peers? What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, lo I love the idea of an arms race with your, right. with your peers or your, your competitors, right? Who but, doesn't? Uh, there, really, there really should be an end goal in mind. And it should be measurable. You know, nothing measured. Nothing measured is nothing gained, right? So when you uh, when you enter into the digital strategy, which is upfront, which is in advance of even that phase zero that we talked about, um, instead of paving cow paths, you're looking at what does the end state look like? What is going to make me, as an organization, more competitive, more uh, responsive to my people? Um, more aware of where my cost centers are and how things need to work together to create, um, you know, a single product, a single service delivery, whatever it is, and and pull all that together as a a a, a measurable total cost of ownership of the implementation of the deployment of the digital transformation solution, and then a, a measurable point or a phase gate at the very end where you determine and you go back to the board and you say, these are the accomplishments that we've made along the way. This is the return that we expected. This is the return that we are getting. Kind of going back to the old time and motion studies that, mm -hmm. uh, that you referred to at the very beginning. Um, you know, what is it, what time and motion does it take to accomplish a task today? And what does it take two years from now when I'm completely done with the ERP implementation. And that is, that is the advantage, that is the return on investment. So I, I think you do have to plan to measure it, right? You have to set up the goals, set up the objectives, and then measure it along the way and measure it at the end. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's well, well put. And I think that, um, you know, this, this thought that your transformation is never really over and there's never really sort of a, a an end end state you're constantly evolving constantly improving constantly looking for ways to improve that's terrifying to some organizations to think about wow that's that's terrifying because we just want to get over this whole digital transformation thing or if you're in the middle of one it the last thing you want to think about is just never getting out of the cycle of constantly improving and, and deploying stuff but that's sort of how organizations need to think and operate uh, going forward is rather than viewing it as a big, massive one-time event, it, you know, may have some, you know, upfront focus, but you, you kind of, you know, you want to keep tweaking, and improving over time, that, that sort of continuous improvement mentality uh, that became popular in the nineties and beyond. Yeah. Well, good. Um, so you talked about interoperability and you did describe it a little bit, but maybe could you just maybe summarize again for us, what, what is interoperability and how does it relate to transformations in the future? Because I think, um, 
you know, I think this is a really important point that not enough organizations think about when they think about their their transformations. Oftentimes, they're looking for that one silver bullet that says, I'm going to implement SAP or Microsoft D365 or Epicor Workday, whatever it is. And they think that's that's the answer. That's the technology that's going to give us what we need. But this concept of interoperability is different than that. How, how would you maybe you could just help us unpack that a bit more? Well, everyone that we talk to is looking for within their digital strategy, a, uh, a unified platform so that they can pull data and information in real time from multiple and disparate sources. Um, the answer to that is very often, well, implement a new ERP system, implement um, SAP, Infor, Oracle, Workday, whatever it is, and you'll have a unified system. Think about all the edge solutions or edge applications and legacy applications that we talked about that are, are still a part of the operations, still a part of the organization. The interoperability piece is you're getting information in a bi-directional um, uh, conduit from those disparate applications and systems into that central ERP system, into that central source of the truth. And that's what interoperability is truly about. It's the um, it's been variously called a, a best of breed type of approach where you've got you may have uh, a different system for HCM and payroll than you have for finance and supply chain. You can't easily change that. How do you optimize that by connecting the ERP systems uh, across, um, you know, an interoperability hub, so to speak. You pick one source of the truth, one ERP system that's going to house, for instance, financials and the reporting and analytics, and then bring the other systems into that in a bi-directional manner, which is the interoperation of those disparate systems. And think about um, you know, mergers and acquisitions. They happen all the time. There's no real uh, predicting that. It can happen in the middle of an implementation. And I've worked with many clients who have found the, uh, the need to integrate a new system into the corporate standard as they're implementing a new ERP system, right? So in order to adopt that new acquisition or merger, um, you really need to interoperate with the systems that are going to be there in legacy until you have the whole system or the, the whole enterprise up on the same platform. And that's what the interoperability piece is all about. That's what's been missing in the past with regard to ERP and ERP system deployment is establishing that interoperability up front. Right. Now, how would you counter a, a either an ERP vendor uh, sales reps message or uh, this is sort of like a political debate, right? This whole concept of single ERP or interoperable multiple systems. It, it's just it feels like that's an ongoing debate that will probably never get resolved, just like politics or you know other other things in life. But um, what? Um, what, what, what do you say to people that say, no, why would you do this interoperability thing with multiple systems when you could just have one system that's fully integrated, ties together all your data, single source of truth, single throat to choke, whatever you want to call it. How, how do you how do you counter that or, or you, you know, what's the what's the trade off there that you see? Well, it, it comes back to, uh, to Ryan's question earlier, right? It's the um, it's really how do you how do you take disparate systems that um, you know, if you talk to the software vendors, they can they can tell you that uh, you know we can provide one unified system that is a source of the truth, that we can provide everything that you need in in one shell. You think about the uh, the software vendor and what their priorities are and how they're going to move forward. They can only touch one system. They can only touch their enterprise software system, right? Their their platform. Um, the ancillary applications and everything else that runs the organization still need to feed into that. So organizations often find out that as they go along, they're, they're choosing a partner, uh, an ERP vendor that is doing great things in terms of HR and finance, um, but they don't touch the workforce management piece. They don't touch the Kronos, the APIs, um, the uh, document management systems. And so 
bringing all that together so it interoperates as, as one really requires that, that independent kind of um, third-party high-level view of how everything will fit. And, and that's what we offer here at, at Third Stage. But, you know, you can, you can choose whichever partner or internally your, um, your enterprise steering team that, uh, that is really going to help determine exactly how you pull all those pieces together. Um, the best of breed approach is often just unavoidable because you cannot move some of the systems that have managed operations and processes in the past. Yeah. 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 You look yeah. at a, a manufacturer, for example, there's so many different applications you need to have, even if you think you want to go with a single ERP system and maybe that's your, your right. propensity is to lean heavy towards if we could, let's do as much as we can within a single ERP system. And I think that's where most of our clients start is they, they sort of lean towards a single system if, if they could. And of course, in a perfect world, if there were a single system out there that does everything you're talking about, then sure, have at it. But the problem is most, if not all, ERP systems are limited in their capabilities. And so you end up trying to figure out how do we plug the holes? How do we how do we give ourselves that competitive edge or that competitive advantage back to the question uh, of one of our, our listeners earlier. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the big challenges. Um, Absolutely. And, and the ERP systems, the ERP vendors are evolving to take on more and more of those edge solutions, more and more of the, the portfolio of applications and systems that you need to operate as a business, especially within verticals and micro verticals, industry specific right. solutions, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, you mentioned a uh, work day earlier, so I'll, let me pick on that for a second, but you look at upstart relatively new or newer, uh, enterprise technology vendors like Workday in the human capital space, or another example would be Salesforce in the CRM or sales automation space. Those are two examples of opportunities that were created because ERP systems couldn't be everything to everyone. So as a result of that, ERP is trying to be everything to everyone, but but these upstart competitors realizing they can't be everything to everyone and we can do certain bits and pieces better than a single ERP system. That's why Workday is so, so successful. That's why Salesforce is so successful in the CRM space is because of the limitations of, of these bigger ERP vendors. So I think you're constantly going to have this push and pull of let's try to have a single system, but in doing so, we're creating weaknesses and vulnerabilities unintentionally, of course. And so there's always going to be other upstart competitors, other vendors that are out there trying to fill those voids, fill those gaps, create niches or create capabilities that others aren't able to do. Absolutely. And the ERP vendors themselves are trying to, you know, get better and better functionality within their own CRM systems, within their own workforce management systems and deploy that as, as, as well. But they are also much more interoperable than they used to be. So the internet of things, the, the ability to connect disparate systems in that interoperability framework that we talked about through APIs, through you know, um, movement of data back and forth has really made it so that you can have a core ERP system and you can branch out to some of these other solutions that you just mentioned as the ERP vendor of choice develops their own internal systems. And then you're going to have a, a decision to make down the road, right? Do we adopt the new CRM system that, you know, um, your software vendor partner has created, or do we stay with Salesforce? So, right, yeah, yeah to come, and you have to look at that objectively. And I think, um, you know, here's a comment that I think sort of ties this all together, um, which I really like. And this is well said. This is from uh, Sorov over on LinkedIn. He says. According to me, all ERP systems are good. And important is your consultant, how much they understand your business, pain areas, organizational goals, and how they can map these all for you. And I think that's really well put because I think that at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's about your business and what your needs are. Your software sales reps are going to have their opinion, their incentives, their motives that sure. may or may not be aligned with what it is you're trying to accomplish as an organization. So you have to take it for what it's worth. Take it with a grain of salt when you get this messaging from software vendors that say, no, no, no one's doing single or, or no one's doing best of breed anymore. It's all about single ERP. Well, you have to recognize that's because they're trying to sell you a single ERP system. It's not because that's for you. So what's the motivation? <laughs> right. Right. 
so I think, uh, you know, that's really the key is let your business drive, you know, what sort of technologies you're, you're going for, um, rather than the other way around. Um, so I guess just to summarize this all and, and to sort of tie this all together, bring it full circle as sort of a, a closing question here. Um, what, given the fact that there's so many options in the marketplace, technology is changing so quickly. Um, there's a lot to think about as you're defining your digital strategy and roadmap. And certainly as you go to execute on that strategy and roadmap, there's even more to think about. But what advice would you give to an organization that's about to embark on some sort of digital transformation or systems modernization initiative? Uh, it, it's really pretty simple. Um, it's, it's establishing that strategy up front. Before you make a selection of a vendor or multiple vendors or really determine how you're going to go forward from a technology standpoint, get your people enrolled, get your people involved in making the changes that are going to make the organization better and bringing that into focus. You know, I, I hate to use the word focus groups, but, um, you know, focus groups, workshops, understanding what the executive imperatives are for the organization and then doing really a top down. We want to get, to a new level of performance as an organization, and then bottom up, here's how we want to participate in what the new enterprise system or operations solution platform is going to look like and get the organization moving in the same direction, right? Everyone's waving the same banner and moving forward. Without that full buy-in, without that, um, you know, kind of uh, unidirectional movement, um, you're you're apt to fail. Uh, you're apt to have you know uh, d uh, differing levels of performance and user ad adoption as you're going forward, unless you get everybody on the on the same page. So that strategy selection of a vendor that is a great partner going forward, and then getting into the phase zero approach of preparing the organization, preparing data sources to be normalized and cleansed and put into the new system. Um, and also all of the integration points and how everything will operate as you go through this interim period where you're supporting operations as well as the project delivery. And that's very important so you don't overwhelm your people. And uh, you know that's, I don't know if that was a simple answer or I really just got into the layering of it, but it is, it is strategy before everything else. Yeah, and back to one of the questions, uh, one of the earliest questions from the audience that I that I got to today, um, it's it's sort of like you you need to um, you need to avoid that sense. I don't want to say avoid the sense of urgency because we're all operating with a sense of urgency, and you want to be act with a sense of urgency, but you don't want to act with such a sense of urgency that you actually create more complications and more problems for yourself that are going to slow things down later on. So, in other words, you know when you talk about getting strategic alignment or, or getting that strategy laid out up front. You also talked earlier about implementation readiness and sort of the phase zero of planning before you start rolling out those chosen technology or technologies. Some people may think in their minds, well, intuitively, that means I'm slowing down the project. It means I can't get to value realization faster. But the reality is the stuff you're talking about is, is actually going to speed things up. I mean, if you get alignment, you have strategic focus and clarity, you have your resources mobilized, you have a clear strategy, all that stuff. Yes, you have to you have to invest some time up front to do that, but that speeds things up so much later on, and it create it, it avoids so many other headwinds and and obstacles that organizations too commonly face. Would you, would you agree with that, Eric? Eric, we've seen that establishing an upfront PMO, um, a, a program management, a strategy, and embarking on a on a phase zero before embarking on phase one of the implementation cuts at least thirty five percent of the cost and time off of an implementation. 35% is probably extremely conservative. So, yeah. so yes, to your point, that really does save time, money, and, and really for the organization, you know, the, the risk mitigation is huge in that. So organizations really need to, to, uh, factor that out. Right. Right. And, and I'll, uh, I'll take one uh, stab at tying this all to pop culture for a second, um, which I'm terrible at, by the way. Um, but I am a big fan of the, the Netflix show uh, Stranger Things. I don't know if you watch that or not, but it's uh, 
a show about reality and then you've got the upside down world which is sort of like a dark evil parallel universe of of the real world <laughs> and it's sort of like if you could run in stranger things if you could run two parallel implementations you'd have the one that's in the upside down world which is sort of the dark evil universe that's where you do things the way that most organizations do it which is let's just jump right in let's just start doing stuff and we're going to do it faster well it creates you know monstrosities of of implementations when you do that but if you do what you're saying you, you actually speed things up and things actually go a lot more smoothly uh in in the in that parallel uh universe so if only we could do like beta testing of two parallel universes like upside down world this whole stranger things concept i think we could probably we could probably get to the bottom of this a little bit easier but i think that's that's a really good metric to work from though that 35 percent metric is uh i i agree with you that is pretty conservative but it's still very material you know that's a difference between a you know a uh a, a two-year project versus a two and a half to three-year project um and you're probably gonna get more value out of it too that's the other part of it um, not only is it going to speed things up by doing what you're talking about, but you're going to get a ton more value out of it. You're going to create a lot less heartache and heartburn for the organization. Um, so, you know, that's a whole other um, set of metrics that are, are impacted as well. And less operational risk along the way. I was wondering where you were going to go with that analogy with the uh, Stranger Things. But I think the, the next project that, uh, that we're involved with, we should probably use that as maybe the name of the project. Stranger Things. Stranger Things. <laughs> that's a bad idea. And then there, yeah, there's a lot of spin-off uh, terminology you could use from that, uh, from that as well. So, <laughs> well, good. Well, Absolutely. great, Lloyd. Well, this is really good stuff. I know we could talk about this for hours, and we do talk about this stuff we for hours. We usually do, Eric. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. But for our audience's sake, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up in the interest of time. But I want to thank you for being here, Greg. This is a great uh, first time appearance you had here uh, as a solo um, discussion or a one-on-one -on -one discussion. So thanks for being here. Absolutely, Eric. Thank you. All right. And thank you to the audience for all the great questions. Thank you for being here today. Uh, keep an eye out for this uh, edited, polished up uh, interview becoming part of the Transformation Ground Control podcast, which we release every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, and all the audio podcast platforms that you might subscribe to podcasts, uh, whether that be Amazon, Google, um, Apple or where, wherever you listen to podcasts. So be sure to check out a new episode tomorrow. Uh, and then a week from tomorrow is when this uh, interview will be featured on that podcast. So be sure to check that out and subscribe to it as well. Um, I am totally biased all minute, but I think it's an awesome show. So be sure to check out that podcast um, and uh, look forward to seeing you there. So thanks everyone for being here today, being part of our production of this podcast. Um, thank you again, Greg, and I uh, hope you all have a, a great week, and we hope to see you next Tuesday on our, on our weekly Digital Transformation live streams. Have a great week in the meantime, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thanks, all.